publican in name only. And they were hissing at him and booing him. It was very evident to that part of the audience that this man was not a genuine Republican. He did not meet the foundational requirements of what it meant to be a Republican. He didn't share Republican views on taxes. He didn't share Republican views on immigration. The very foundational things that make someone a Republican in 2017 did not find agreement with him. I wish I could say it was that easy for us as Christians to determine whether the most foundational parts of Christianity met up with someone who says they're a brother in the faith. While it's not the easiest thing in the world, we can get from this first letter of John at least some of the basics across. We do get sort of a series of tests or proofs, as Mike alluded to last week, that will help us to determine the genuine nature of someone's faith. Now, I started by telling you about a political event that I went to. It's all too important that we don't confuse that with testing the genuine nature of someone's faith. Does that follow? Because all too often... We take this departure from 1 John, and we start to impose a lot of our own tests on the genuine nature of someone's faith. Did they vote one way or the other? How do they feel about the topic du jour of the day? But I think 1 John calls us back to more foundational, doctrinal things that have to do with our faith and encourages us to use those to really determine how close someone is to being an authentic Christian, to having their Christian credentials verified. I'll tell you, some cases are fairly easy. There's a guy who I know, lives over on the East Coast, you'll never meet him, but he is in a relationship now, and and the, the woman in this relationship has said, we're supposed to be Christians, celibacy is the way to go, right? That should be the obvious call, and he's having a lot of trouble with it. He's even going to the internet and finding proofs against it, looking for excuses to try to sort of talk her into the idea that relations before marriage is okay, even within a Christian worldview. Now, you can start there and say, I'm not sure this person's faith is genuine, right? That's one of the more obvious tests. That's one of the more obvious cases. It's not always going to be that easy, and so these lessons from 1 John become very important. The first test that's presented to us today Walking in the light. John's assertion, we find in verse 5, that God is light. John calls this very simple statement, God is light. The message we have heard from him, that is Jesus, and proclaim to you, which is a true statement, although not a word-for-word reiteration of Jesus' teaching. You can go back through the Gospels and you will not find Jesus proclaiming God is light. So this assertion that God is light summarizes more what John learned about God from Jesus, from observations of Jesus' life, more than a word-for-word teaching. So we can accept this idea that God is light as a lesson learned from the overall experience that John had with Jesus and, and everything that he learned from him. Now you might say, well, Jesus refers to himself as the light at least once in John's gospel. True enough. But when John says God is light here in verse 5, he's probably not speaking specifically about Jesus. This is pointing to the Father. We can reason that because even though Jesus described himself as the light in John's gospel, there are references throughout this first letter of John to Jesus where he speaks about him by name or the title of the Son. So when he says God is light, he's probably not speaking about Jesus. He's probably pointing to the Theos, the Father. This is a pretty common theme, actually, especially as you go through the Old Testament. God is presented as light or a representation of light throughout the Old Testament. You go to Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, where God goes before Israel as a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel at night. That is, so they could travel through the darkness. Psalm 104, 1 through 2, sings of God as clothing himself with light as a garment. 2 Samuel 22, 29, the prayer of David. David prays, for you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. So we can affirm from the totality of Scripture that, yes, this affirmation that God is light is not only accurate, it's meaningful. 
scripturally tested and traditionally true. But if it's meaningful, then what does it mean for us to say that God is light? What is light like? Light is pure. In Him there is no darkness at all. Light by its very nature has to be pure because the only thing that it can't be is darkness. Light drives out darkness and illuminates the way, much like that pillar of fire did for the nation of Israel. Light uncovers the things that we would rather keep shrouded in darkness. Gary Burge wrote the NIV application commentary and teaches theology at a university somewhere. Wrote this, light unveils our spiritual identity, whether we abide in the sun and identifies boldly those who live in darkness. Therefore, light also has a judging function because it unveils. I'll tell you, marching along mountainsides in Afghanistan at night, the worst thing that could have happened to us was become shrouded in light. And though we had a noble cause, the, the cause effect is somewhat similar. We didn't want to be discovered, therefore we fled from light. In fact, you were not allowed to carry a white light flashlight. You had to carry a red one that was completely useless but acceptable by army standards. There are things we'd rather keep shrouded in darkness. I love the way Burge puts it. Light has a judging function because it unveils the things that we would rather keep hidden. When we say God is light, I think it means all of these things. That God is pure. That God does illuminate the way for us with truth and wisdom. And that God does have this judging function that light also has. So we go from John to Sersen. To John's reasoning, if God is light, then those who have fellowship with him are in the light. Those who do not are in the darkness. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So what does it mean to walk in darkness? Well, we can take some insights, I think, from John's gospel. We can go to chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus speaking. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 12, verse 35, where Jesus is making what was his last appeal to the Jews in Jerusalem to follow him. He said this, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. In these entries, Jesus describes himself as the light and those who do not accept or follow him as walking in darkness. According to Jesus' definition, the light is the very special revelation offered through him, and those who walk in darkness are all who reject him. We can safely say, I think, that anyone who rejects Jesus is one who walks in the darkness, one who has not accepted that revelation that came from the light. Though the light illuminates the way, it's up to us to choose whether to follow it or whether to stay shrouded in darkness. That term walk in, as in walk in the light, is also a Semitic idiom. John was a Semitic writer. The phrase to walk in something appears in Proverbs 8.20. I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of paths of justice. The phrase implies action beyond reflection and internal meditation, so that walking in light and walking in darkness, much like walking in righteousness from that verse in Proverbs, take on this meaning that encompasses one's lifestyle. To walk in something means to actively participate it, according to this old Semitic idiom. To walk in darkness is to participate in darkness with your lifestyle, with your choices, with your ethics. To walk in light is to participate in a lifestyle of light, of purity, illumination, wisdom. It's to make those active moral, ethical, and lifestyle choices that reflect the light that God gives to us. We can reason that walking in darkness and walking in light must mean two things then. To accept the light of Jesus, His wisdom and revelation of the truth, which is what seems to come out of John's gospel, and to make the kind of moral and ethical decisions that God desires, which is what we draw from the meaning of those words to walk in. If God is light, then walking in light demands that we reflect Him. To walk in the light must mean to reflect the light. So if that is God, then walking in Him, having fellowship in Him, means that we must reflect Him 
as we live out there in the world. I love this little entry from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Walking in darkness refers not so much to what people do as to what they are by nature, which is revealed in John's view by whether or not they accept Jesus. Those who do not accept Him deceive themselves if they claim to have fellowship with God. This is not a question of the small and and even amoral choices that one might make. It is a question of our very nature. Is it of your nature to be walking in light and reflecting it, or is it of your nature to be in the darkness? So one of the questions that hinges on all this then is, is, does that mean sin puts us out in the darkness? I think we have to remember that this is not a call for external righteousness, but moral purity. The light is pure, and if we believe in Jesus, then we walk in the light, but we have to remember that we are not the light. We merely reflect it. The perfection and the wisdom of God, we get to reflect that out in the world. We do this by affirming our belief in the incarnate, resurrected Jesus and following his teachings. Walking in light is as much a moral and doctrinal commitment as it is an ethical one. 1 John 1, 7 through 8 seems to show that even believers have sin, and yet John does not put us as believers out into the darkness in anything that he writes. Though we are all sinners, we remain in fellowship with God through faith and continual forgiveness. It should be very clear that by God's grace, this relationship is possible. Us being allowed to walk in the light is something that God does, not something that that we accomplish. It is on us to maintain that faith and, and seek that continual forgiveness, but it is all the work of God. It is not something that we do to win it or to attain it. John's language is very typically black and white. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son has not life. That verse doesn't appear in this first letter, but it's one of my favorite parts of the entire Bible because it seems so plain. That is a perfect example of what I mean by John's black and white language. You either have the Son and have life, or you have not the Son and therefore you have not life. However, we shouldn't take this black and light language to reflect a sort of us and them, or even worse, us versus them kind of proclamation. It's not that we are in the light and everyone else is in the darkness and the two must never meet, or that the two must be opposed to each other. That kind of thinking, I would say, is actually a fairly anti-Christian ethic. If we are in the light, we should recognize our calling as sharing that light with others. Different author, different context, but still biblical, Luke 11.33, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. If you are walking in the light and you are reflecting the light, don't hide it from those who are in the darkness. Cast it out in front of them and hope and pray that at least one might be inspired to respond to that light that you're reflecting. The point of this first test, if someone believes in the doctrines of the incarnate and divine Jesus and reflects his heart, they are walking in the light. John comes to us with an assurance. If we accept Jesus, we have fellowship with one another and we have forgiveness. 1-7, if we walk in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Only those who accept Jesus will have fellowship and forgiveness of sin through the sacrifice of Jesus. However, this also implies that all who accept Jesus should have fellowship with one another and forgiveness of sin. This fellowship and forgiveness permeates all cultural, social, and political lines among Christians. That was why when I started, I was saying we often impose a lot of our own tests. But to walk in the light doesn't follow any particular cultural sect. To walk in the light has primarily to do with our faith in Jesus and the forgiveness of sin and fellowship with one another. If we have that, we should have fellowship with with all of our fellow believers regardless of what else comes along with it. I think we can all pray today um, that God would simply let us be people who walk in the light and reflect it. Lord, please do this for us. Our second test 
the necessary repentance of sin. If anybody had raised eyebrows over the title of the sermon, Necessary Sin, this is the part where you start to listen. Any claim to be without sin is deception, according to John. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We should point out that John is talking about how we, quote-unquote, have sin. That is, that sin is a part of us. This might be what Martin Luther would describe as having a sin nature, that it's within our very nature since the fall to commit sin or even to want sin at times. If we say humankind is not prone to sin, then we're deceiving ourselves, according to John. We know that Satan is the great deceiver, And that he has been from the very beginning. In Eden, he asked Eve, did God really say dot, dot, dot? And convinced her that that what God had said, that if you ate of the fruit of the tree that you would die, was wrong. He told her, you certainly will not die. It is in the deceiver's best interest to have the believing community misunderstanding the reality and the seriousness of sin in our lives. So this letter from John becomes very important because we must recognize and confess sin. Why is confession of sin necessary? Well, because a claim to not have sin is a claim to not need a Savior. It sounds a bit absurd, I know, but imagine, a lot of you parents, uh, imagine if you had a 16-year-old son or daughter and they're just gearing up for that special time in their life where they're going to get their driver's license really the only rite of passage we have for American adolescents in the modern age, that they're finally going to get licensed to drive themselves and latch on to that small piece of independence they get before they become adults. You tell your son or daughter, we're going to get you signed up for behind-the-wheel lessons tomorrow. You're going to start soon, kid. I can't wait to see you on the road. And your son or daughter throws their hands up and says, well, mom or dad, I don't need driving instructions. In fact, I think tomorrow I'm going to go race at Formula One. (laughs) You be careful over there. This might happen to you. That sounds absurd, doesn't it? But it's on the same level as saying, I don't have sin and therefore I don't need a Savior. Now, someone who stands up and says, I don't have sin, might not be writing the other half of that sentence, but it's certainly implied. It's certainly there. If you believe that you don't have sin, you must also believe that you don't need someone to come and save you from it. From the Old Testament through the New Testament, both Jew and Gentile alike are shown to be sinners. We can go to Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. Paul wrote this, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. No one is righteous. No, not one. All of us share this burden. All of us are infected by this. All sinners need the Son to set them free from practicing sin. This is Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 33 through 36, speaking to a crowd of Jews. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone seems to be a misunderstanding of their own history, but we'll continue. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is perhaps one of the most literal definitions of what it means that Jesus is our savior, that he enters into our lives and frees us from our slavery to sin. That is a powerful part of my own testimony, and I know it's probably a powerful part of every testimony in this room, that we were called out of a life in which we were slaves to sin to become servants of Jesus. Anyone who holds themselves up as sinless and morally and religiously righteous is equally as absurd as the Pharisee who Jesus kind of parodies In his parable presented in Luke chapter 18, verses 11 through 14, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give all the tithes that I get. But the tax collector, 
standing far off, would not even lift his, eye, lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. If we say that we are sinless or even that we sin less, this is what we sound like. We lessen our need for Jesus the more we think that we can depend on our own righteousness and goodness, which appears to be strictly unbiblical in the first place. When we are doing the truth is when we acknowledge and repent of sin, not when we think ourselves to be without it. Now, I suppose I could have and maybe should have titled today's sermon Necessary Repentance, but I thought necessary sin would catch more eyeballs. That's not really why. Um, For there to be repentance and thus forgiveness, there must first be sin. X plus 2 equals Y cannot function without the X. If you take it out, then you just have Y equals 2. Sorry for those of you who did not major in math, neither did I. But for that whole function to work, all three parts must be there. Sin, repentance, and forgiveness all have to be present in this greater function for forgiveness to happen. If we say we're without sin, not only do we declare that we don't need a Savior, but frankly, we render the cross unnecessary. As John wrote, chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his Son, is what cleanses us from all sin. That's from this letter. Verse, one, verse 9 of chapter 1 reassures us that if we confess our sins, God forgives us and cleanses us. John links this forgiveness directly to the nature and character of God. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can be assured of our forgiveness because God is faithful and God is just. We understand it is just to offer and receive forgiveness. This should probably factor into the way that we reflect the light as we walk in it. This understanding of God's nature has been present from Moses' time and onwards. It's not a New Testament reshaping of God's character, but a reminding of the God who we have worshipped since Eden. Uh, I, (laughs) I didn't point this out because of something I heard earlier this week, but something I heard earlier this week does remind me of this. A certain radio host is coming out with a book about faith and God and, and, and reason and all that. And he's talking to a caller who phoned in. And he actually said, I prefer the Old Testament because I think the New Testament kind of waters down God's message a little bit. Don't you? And the caller said, oh, yes, 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 I do. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. It's as though this person believed that the New Testament was somehow a polemic or a reshaping of God's character, but God's character has been to be just and forgiving and loving since the Old Testament. It's exhausting at times to meet people who say something like, ah, I kind of prefer the Old Testament, God. He seemed a little more real, you know. <laughs> I kind of like the righteousness and judgment stuff. It's the same God all the way through. <laughs> and to say that there's a separation between the two Testaments, the nature of God is to completely ignore what the Bible's about, but I digress. We can see that God is faithful and just and good going all the way back to Deuteronomy. When some people might say he was at his height of being the angry, judgmental God. Chapter 32, verse 4. God is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Faithful and just, the same two words that John uses to describe the nature of God here in this letter. To assure us that forgiveness is given upon repentance of sin. Verse 10 of chapter 1 gives a slight twist on the same issue addressed in verse 8, only now John speaks about the action of sin rather than a sin nature. He writes, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So remember, the first one was if we say we don't have sin, right? That speaks a little more of a sin nature. Now we're talking about the action of going out and doing sin. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Saying there are no sinful actions is basically what this amounts to. And it presents the same issues as saying that we are not inherently sinful and that it removes the need for a Savior. If nothing we do is sinful, why would we ever have to be forgiven of sin? If anyone has ever asked, what do I do that's so bad that I need forgiveness? I'm a generally good person. I pay my taxes. I vote. 
I mow my neighbor's lawn. I mow my lawn. I pay the HOA on time. What do I do that's so bad that I need forgiveness? They may be echoing the same line of thought presented in verse 10 as to say, I don't do anything that is sinful, therefore I don't do anything that needs forgiveness. And this is where evangelism is going to grind against them a little bit. We have to remember that the gospel is offensive precisely because it identifies our need for a Savior. There's a huge movement among sort of the, well, I guess they're not really the new atheists anymore, but they're the less old atheists now. <laughs> they call it the good without God movement. It's part of the humanist philosophy that the atheist community has, that man is inherently good and that we don't need God as a source of morality and good ethics. I don't know that John would agree. We do seem to have a nature that is prone to sin. We do seem to commit a lot of acts that we could identify as sin. And therefore, we have a desperate need for a Savior, for forgiveness. Anyone who ascribes to that kind of humanist philosophy is is going to be directly opposed to this idea and may find it offensive. Every invitation that Jesus makes to follow me is an invitation to genuine and transformative repentance. Remember, repentance was beyond confession. I got to stand up here and share with you guys a lot from Isaiah chapter 1 about that, that it's it's more than confession. It's more than what was happening in Judah during Isaiah's time, which was a lot of sacrifice and ceremony. It was a genuine turning of the heart and a turning of the lifestyle. When Jesus stands on the coast and says, follow me, he's inviting his disciples to give up what they know and what they do and to make this turn and follow him. Every invitation to follow me is an invitation to transformative and genuine repentance. This happens by accepting Jesus, observing and owning up to our sin, and allowing God to forgive us. As God, who is light, shines his light into our darkness, our sin is revealed. And we are accountable then to repentance. We can be assured that God does indeed forgive because it is in his nature as a God who is good and just to forgive us. The work of our forgiveness, hint, hint, has already been completed as Jesus said when he hung, I'm pretty sure on that cross. (laughs) That's not the one, kidding. But as Jesus said when he hung on the cross, it is finished. We do the truth which is sort of the awkward phrasing of John's letter. We do the truth when we recognize sin for what it is, when we accept the fact that it lives in us in action and nature, and then when we ask God for forgiveness and trust that forgiveness will be given because the work of it has been completed and we know that we worship a God who loves us, who cares about us, wants to be actively involved with us, and who is just and who's good. We can also pray today that the Lord would simply let us do the truth then by recognizing sin for what it is and asking to be forgiven of it, to walk in the light and drive all that sin back out into the darkness. There's a third test that John presents us with, obedience and Christ-likeness. We're into chapter 2 now. John begins chapter 2 by telling us that he's written this letter so that his readers will not sin. We are reminded here that he's ministering to a group of believers, providing his leadership and his instruction. Here we find the introduction of the third test. If anyone is of genuine faith, they will recognize Jesus as our Savior and will not desire a life of continual sin. 1 John 2 begins in very much the same way 1 John 1 5 did, by explaining the nature of God, only this time we're not pointing to the Father, we're pointing to the Son. 1 John 1.5 said, God is light. And now in 1 John 2, we see Jesus is an advocate with the Father. He is the righteous. And in verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he satisfies God, which Jesus does not just for us, but for the entire world. Again, it's a statement about the nature of who God is. Only now we're speaking about the Son and we have a few more titles to deal with. Jesus is the advocate In Greek, the parakletos. I'm learning Greek, by the way. (laughs) 
language usually reserved for the Holy Spirit throughout the Gospels is being used for Jesus here. Among the definitions for parakletos is the one intended by John, that is one who pleads another's cause before a judge, a pleader, a counsel for defense, an advocate. If we receive a picture of Jesus then as our special pleader in heaven, arguing our case with the Father, that is appropriate according to John's writing. The end of Hebrews chapter 7, the beginning of Hebrews chapter 8, summarized Jesus' role as our advocate very well. Specifically, we're talking about Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, through chapter 8, verse 2. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unsustained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. These verses from Hebrews place God in front of the throne of the Father, making intercession daily, knowing that his sacrifice was the sacrifice once and for all for forgiveness of sin. So this term advocate suddenly becomes very visually appropriate. The righteous John describes Jesus as the righteous. If we need some expository teaching on why Jesus can appropriately be called the righteous, then I think we're in a little bit more trouble as a church than we originally thought. So we're just going to accept that Jesus is the righteous. And finally is the propitiation for our sins. In Greek, that is the halosmos. This word only appears within 1 John. It appears here and again in chapter 4, verse 10. The definition speaks precisely to Jesus' role as our atoning sacrifice, that is, a sacrifice that bears God's wrath and turns it to favor. John again states that Jesus is the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. So now we arrive at the real, the heart of the third test, chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. We know that we have come to know him is written in that perfect tense, implying that this knowing is not a one-time thing, but an ongoing thing. John states that we can know someone loves Jesus by their desire to keep Jesus' commandments. Obedience to Jesus is the essence of this third test. So, what commands did Jesus leave us to follow? Well, I'm sure there's some verses in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, which we've all heard a few times. This we call the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The other most prominent one would have to be the Great Commandment. A few chapters earlier, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So how do we know that someone desires to obey Jesus? They take discipleship seriously, as the Great Commission seems to imply. They love God with everything they have, the Shema, which appears in Deuteronomy. And finally, they love others as themselves. This is what it means to serve Jesus. This is what it means to obey and to follow Jesus, to follow these commandments that He appeared to hold so dear, that He told His disciples are the first and most important. These three things allow us to know God beyond a way that academic knowledge and even spiritual experience can offer to us. We can know a lot of things about God. That's that kind of academic nature. 
Someone might be waiting in these seats today to come up to me after the sermon and, and pull some line out of Habakkuk that I don't remember. That's a lot of that academic knowing. We can know a lot of things, which is inherently good. I'm not here to bash that. We can have a lot of spiritual experience with God, which is also inherently good, that sort of experiential knowing of, of what God is like and, and what He does for us, what it means to receive blessing or forgiveness or be corrected. But keeping all of the three things that we talked about, that is discipleship, loving God, and loving others, in doing that, we get to care about the things that God cares about. That's a certain level of knowing that I think we only tap into by doing this very active kind of following Jesus. We get to care about the things that God cares about. And what does God care about? The poor, the needy. He desperately cares about the people who reject Him. He wants them to accept Him. He wants them to attain salvation. We obey Jesus when our hearts are like His heart, when we care about the same things that He does. This kind of obedience gives us something that neither the hard factual knowing nor the individual spiritual experience can give us, the opportunity to share in the heart and the ethics of the God of the universe. That, to me, is, is the test. That is walking in the light, caring about the same things that your God cares about. Whoever obeys Jesus, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Chapter 2, verse 5 of this letter continues into verse 6. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So I hope you all look good in sandals. And I hope you're all ready to move to Galilee. That doesn't seem to be what this is implying. This is the last part of the test. Christ-likeness, the ultimate proof of the genuine nature of someone's faith is how much like the master they are and how much like the master they want to be. Henry Nouwen, Roman Catholic spiritual writer, wrote in a little book, all of his books were little books, but he wrote in this little book called The Selfless Way of Christ, indeed to live a spiritual life means to become living Christ. It is not enough to try to imitate Christ as much as possible. It is not enough to remind others of Jesus. It is not even enough to be inspired by the words and actions of Jesus Christ. No, the spiritual life presents us with a far more radical demand to be living Christ here and now in time and history. You might remember that I mentioned a guy who I know lives on the East Coast at the beginning of this message that he's sort of failing to be a, a Christian boyfriend and sort of failing to be a Christian overall. You might have forgotten about him. You might have written him off right away because it was so obvious that he's not quite one of us. He's not walking in light. He's not, he's not doing the truth. In fact, he seems to be doing the opposite. He's not obeying Jesus. But I tell you that Jesus has not written him off. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is ministering to him daily. He's probably doing it right now. If we're going to walk as Jesus walked, we can't write people off who Jesus is interested in. If you know someone fails the tests that we've discussed today, you pass this last test of Christ-likeness by ministering to them. You pass this test of obedience by discipling them and serving them caring about them, and hopefully inviting them to come and walk in the light with you. As the band rejoins us, we'll consider our next step. Put yourself through these three tests. Do you walk in the light? Do you do truth? Do you obey Jesus? If you can answer yes to all three, then please go minister to someone who doesn't. If not, come back to us. And together, we'll work on getting you a passing grade. Thank you so much.